there is a very special moment, and a very beautiful moment, that I want to share with you in 10 years from now. And if I wasn't certain that in 10 years from now it will happen, I wouldn't be on this red spot today. If you are an entrepreneur, a decision maker, or simply a person who cares, in 2030, we are all going to celebrate. What am I talking about? I was five years old when it was the last time I celebrated my birthday with my mother in the city of Kuwait. The Gulf War broke out and my parents fled to Lebanon. Soon after, they got divorced. And my mom left to Florida in the US. The war broke my family. But it gave me superpowers. It made me the invisible man. According to UN, the title invisible is given to people who do not have birth certificates. And during the Gulf War, the birth registries were burned. And I lost the only piece of paper that proves my existence, my birth certificate. And furthermore, until today, under the place of birth, on my driving license, it's written, I'm born in unknown. And similar to me, 290 million children, 290 million children under the age of five do not have this document at birth. And with their invisible status, they get deprived from education, healthcare, mobility, and even worse, they become vulnerable to sex trafficking and child labor just because of a piece of paper. So my superpowers were put to test in a different way. Growing up in Lebanon was not easy, but it was fun. See, Lebanon is like Cyprus. You can eat good halloumi cheese. You can have a beautiful walk on the beach. The difference is we are in constant wars with our neighbors. Yet, under the sounds of explosions, I managed to finish school, graduate from university with a degree in business economics. And more than 10 wars in Lebanon had its toll on the economy. So after my graduation, I found myself working in Dubai. In 2010, I landed a job in The Hague, in the city of peace and justice, as a knowledge worker, as a skilled immigrant. And I was living the Dutch dream. I mastered the art of complaining about the weather and about taxes. And I even got myself a dog. Every Sunday, I would go to the local football team, Adu Den Haag, and cheer for them. In 2012, I got introduced to Bitcoin, an innovation in digital money. Something that the Dutch themselves were pioneers in 1990, electronic money. Two years later, in 2014, my Dutch dream came to a sad end. My work contract was not renewed, and the immigration services asked me to go back where I came from, because the reason to stay in the Netherlands was not valid anymore, which was work. 
If you have been listening, you can recall I'm born in Kuwait. I was raised in Lebanon. I worked in Dubai. But I don't have any of these nationalities. My father is Syrian. With no choice, I inherited his nationality, and I became a Syrian national. So I have a Syrian passport. In 2014 is the climax of the Syrian war, and going back to a war-torn country was not an option. So the only road for me was asylum. And I took the decision to apply for asylum in the Netherlands. I packed a small bag, and I went from my home in The Hague to The Hague Central Station. I booked a train ticket to a village called Ter Apel, which is in the northern part of the country where the immigration center is. 23 September 2014, I was sleeping in my own house, in my own room, under a warm blanket. 24 September 2014, I'm sleeping on the cold floor of an immigration detention center. And to comfort myself, I was saying, Tay, you speak Dutch. You read the Dutch newspapers. You even got your visa to the Netherlands from the Dutch embassy in Dubai. And I can eat the Dutch raw fish, the herring, so what could go wrong? It took me two years to finish my asylum process. And for two years, I was detained in refugee camps with people who were aliens for me, but we share the same nationality. And there I realized I'm not the only invisible man. Now, I'm living with 15,000 people who do not have an identity, who do not have their academic certificates, who do not have their land titles, and who do not have access to banking services. We were all hanging on hope. That's what we had. And the other thing that we shared we all complained about the food. So as you can imagine, the food menu in a refugee camp is not from the landmark hotel. In the morning, we got three slices of bread and two slices of cheese. For lunch, we had a cup of soup and two boiled eggs. And for dinner, it was a full plate of half-cooked rice and some vegetables. So for one day, I was doing my blessings three times a day because, in fact, I'm having a meal three times a day. A few days passed by, and I said to myself, Tay, you need a diet. You know, food, the food is good. But after a month has passed by, I said, I have to consider my options. I'm fed up from eating the same food every day. And just right that moment, I had an epiphany. The solution was there right in front of my eyes, in my hands, in my pocket, my smartphone, my internet connection, and my own bank. Yes, my own bank, my Bitcoin wallet app. So I had Bitcoins on my phone, and there was a takeaway website where you can pay with Bitcoin and order food. What do you think happened next? I ordered the largest pepperoni pizza I could find. And it got delivered to the door of the refugee camp. It was a victory. Because for the first time in human history, for the first time in human history, Lack of identification was no longer a problem for financial inclusion. Nobody asked me for my first name, my last name, my date of birth, my place of birth, when I wanted to transact. 
All what I did was download an application and the invisible man was eligible for a pizza. The news spread like fire in the camp. And I became the king of this refugee camp. <laughs> we had feasts with other refugees. And many of them considered using that money, using that technology, to transact money back to Syria. Money that they earned doing online and offline micro or nano jobs. And that state, that victory, gave me the confidence to take on a bigger challenge. And I was thinking to myself, if we were able to use Bitcoin and blockchain technology to break financial barriers, are we able to do the same to break identity barriers? And the answer to that question came from looking at my journey as a refugee in the Netherlands, where in two years, I moved between five refugee camps. And I carried with me 14 kilograms of paper, crossing 985 kilometers in the Netherlands. And similar to that journey, many mothers in Southeast Asia and in Central Africa, under the burden of bureaucracy, they cannot register their children because they live in rural areas far away from the birth registration centers. They're deprived from that piece of paper. And paper being fragile, easy to lose, hard to verify, carries also a hidden cost. We can measure it in time and in money. The cost of transportation, the cost of stamps and fees that you people have to pay. So, if I said going digital is a good solution, I think everyone in this room would be agreeing with me. In fact, citizens would be benefiting from digital IDs because we can reduce the time of registration from multiple days to few minutes. And we can reduce the cost of registration from multiple dollars to very few cents. And citizens would be able to benefit from a one-step, one-verification registration system. Governments would be able to free their staff to focus on other public duties. And this is where governments like it the most, they'll be able to make more money because of increased income from increased registrations. In that room in the heart of the refugee camp, I was able to advocate for using digital birth registration systems to close the gap on the invisible children and leverage the benefits of blockchain technology to build resilient identity systems so that no one has to lose his identity again. Whether using blockchain as a technology to prevent data from being tampered, frauded, or permanently lost. Or using the technology as a way to build digital payment systems that are borderless, open, and neutral. The technology doesn't do a change by itself. It's the humans who do. It's you who do. In one year, I was able to break barriers, although I don't have ID, and travel the world sharing my story with everyone to inspire entrepreneurs, decision makers, and public figures so that they can be the agents of change that we need to build a technology that is inclusive for everyone, including refugees. And I'm here to share my story with you today 
not only to inspire you, but to ask you to join me in my mission. Zero invisible children by 2030. And this is not only our mission. This is a global goal that we have set with the United Nations under UNSDG 16.9. United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 16.9 simply says free birth registrations for all the children by 2030, leaving no one behind, including the refugees. Finally, in my journey, I was able to inspire someone who I had no intention at all to inspire. My mom, who I haven't seen in the past 20 years, is back in my life. And with finding her, I found the partner that I needed to complete my journey as the Invisible Man. And together, we are writing my story in a book that we plan to call The Invisible Man. And I can't wait to share with her all the details that she missed in my life, especially how did the pizza change my life forever? Thanks so much. Thank you.